that you brought the um, awareness of what corner men do in the corner for boxers and other fighters. How did you do that? No, I never seen anybody. You know, that's a good question, AJ. Uh, helping people have always, has always been something my family has always done. My parents always gave back uh, when uh, people needed help. Uh, <clears throat> but knowledge, I was trying to learn to be a cut man and I asked this one guy and he told me to basically F you that you gotta learn like me and I'm taking it to my grave, he said, and he walked away and nobody wanted to teach. And I said, <clears throat> I'm never gonna be like this man, I'm gonna teach. So my job, my legacy as I leave it is that I made this game a lot safer in making rules and regulations and protecting these fighters uh, like, like they're our babies. It's now April 2023, and 23 years ago, you made a movie called Boxer's Nightmare. I did. What is that nightmare about? You know, AG, I always wanted to do instructional videos, and uh, me and this young filmmaker, John Barnhouse, uh, did an interview called Boxer's Nightmare, and it deals with all the issues that hurt fighters. And at that time, it was only boxing. But everybody that I have in there are all Hall of Famers. Uh, Mike Tyson, before he got his tattoo. Fernando Vargas, when he was gonna fight. Felix Trinidad, Eddie Mustafa Muhammad, <clears throat> Emmanuel Stewart, uh, Richard Steele, Joe Cortez, Mills Lane. Uh, all these Hall of Famers, they all came forward and gave the world ideas of how we can make this game better. Uh, but John passed away about four months ago and I looked at this film, I haven't seen it in over 15 years. And it's a shame because uh, what was brought up then as solutions, as problems and solutions, nothing's ever been done. And now we have MMA involved and the same things that are that happen to boxers are happening to, happening to MMA. But uh, hopefully with uh, uh, the, the work we did with the original Boxers Nightmare, uh, we'll get the word out and Try to make it safer for these fighters with insurance plans, with uh, health and fitness and everything. You know, so boxer's nightmare. I've never seen a film like that focusing on that subject. And I never seen, I never met any boxing people, industry people who talk about it. I come from there too. And I know many people but I never met anybody who talk about it. And uh, it takes a courage because- Yeah, it's... you know, it, it, it really does. Well, it takes, <clears throat> takes passion. You know, I think if you're doing the right things, you have courage anyway, but it takes passion. And, you know, like the UFC, I was with the UFC from day one. I knew Dana White, uh, before the UFC, he brought me in, changed my life. And uh, But I always worked with sponsors, and when they would sponsor me, I would negotiate for the other cut men to get us some extra money, right? Well, the UFC went into the Reebok deal where it was exclusive, and <clears throat> excuse me, all the fighters, they all lost their sponsorships and hundreds of thousands of dollars. The cut men, they took our sponsors. Anyway, I did an interview they called me and uh, never knew the guy, John Nash, bloodyalbo.com. He called me and asked if I'd be interested in doing a video or an interview on how the Reebok deal affected the cut men. Well, growing up as a farm worker and my parents fighting for the rights of farm workers with Cesar Chavez, and I thought about them and I said, you know what, if I don't speak up, you know, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. Uh, the interview was very politically correct, but it went viral. And because uh, of that, I started started some waves and the UFC tried to cut the head off the dragon and they fired me, but it was the best thing that happened to me because I spoke out about everything that was hurting guys in MMA. So it's been eight years and people still stop me all over the world and congratulate me, but throughout the whole eight years, 
the best thank you I got was from a great Brazilian coach, Luis Doria, that trained Anderson Silva and all these Brazilian fighters. He comes up to me after eight years, I haven't seen him, and he says, Stitch, we, the coaches, the fighters, we thank you for speaking up because we couldn't. AG, that's it at all. So as, as, as that continued, about two weeks later, the UFC has their first big show on Fox Network, and they're interviewing Dana White, and they ask Dana, well, what about Stitch Durant? Is Stitch ever coming back? And he said, nah, you know what? Stitch will never be back, and so-and-so, he should have called me, and this and that, and then at the end, he blows it, and I don't know why he said it, but he says, uh, Stitch and I were never friends, and till this day, People are making memes about him saying Stitch and I were never friends. People all, all want to do the right things, but many don't. And the reason why, probably you're not conscious about it, but from my, the way I look at you tells me that uh, you have this courage because you come, you come from the fields in California when you were little. Yeah. Uh, if you come from, in other words, if you come from the most comfortable place and such, I don't think you will speak up. What do you think? Well, nobody from a comfortable place has ever spoken up. So <laughs> I think you kind of answered your own question, AG. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, I know, I don't know about courage. Just, you know, I just, you know, like I always told my children, if you do things the right way, you don't have to worry about nothing. So much easier being a nice guy than being a bad guy. And I think if you follow those rules, you know, when you know what right is right and what wrong is wrong, and then you speak up for it, then, you know, I don't think it takes courage. I just think it takes somebody saying, you know what, man, <laughs> this isn't right. Maybe it does take courage, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you think it was that your father or mother who was like that? They both were. Your character, okay. <laughs> they, they, they both were. As we were growing up as farm workers, uh, the little town that I grew up in, well, that I moved to, Planada, it was like 1,500 people at that time. And in the summertime, when it was time to pick the crops, the town would get all these migrant workers, you know, by the large, large numbers. And my parents would always help them find a place to stay and then give them a job. So that was something we've done all our lives, you know. Uh, when you're poor, you stick together, you know, to make the best out of it. And I remember when I was in the Air Force, I get back and my little sister Belen says, oh, gee, we had a tough time. We just ate beans and potatoes. I said, well, you were lucky you had potatoes, <laughs> you know. So when you get to those situations, yeah, you have to speak up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, beans are good. But now you look at beans, it was a poor man's meal. Now you look at all these people that like the black beans and they like all this because now it's in cliche. Mm -hmm. We did it because we were poor. You are a big time corner man. I'm a small time corner man. But what I do when I wrap hands of my fighters is I'm putting all my love in the bandage. Every every layer I make, it's my love. And then what I'm saying to the fighter is, don't worry about anything. Just don't worry. Um, you will do your job fine. That's what I put into every layer of wrapping hands. And uh, you wrapped my hand once, and it was the same. <laughs> uh, yeah. So anyway, you've wrapped many thousand times of all people from all over the world. Yeah. No borders, you know. Uh, it's quite a thing to do. It's not just wrapping hands. It's wrapping people together. Or, or, what can you say about wrapping hands? It's an interesting job. Yeah, and, and yeah, it is interesting. 
and basically the 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 principle the physical principle of wrapping a hand is excuse me <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> the principal reason of wrapping a hand is so the fighter don't break it getting ready for a fight right <clears throat> but the intricacies or what happens in during that process it's a mental game you know this guy is getting ready to go to battle you are the guy from the old gladiator days that's putting the armor on him by wrapping his hands but at the same token you have to understand that they're modern day gladiators <clears throat> but deep inside they're all babies and your job is to take care of the baby right and and that process starts right then and there and they have the confidence in you you make them smile you take that that nervousness away from them you give them a goal of what you're going to be able to do and you send them out there just like they're your sons and daughters You've been in many boxing movies, and the most well-known ones I know are Rocky Balboa, the last chapter of Rocky series, yeah. and then Creed 1, 2, 3. Yes. Wow. Great. You know, and you're the only one who is credited as himself. <laughs> <laughs> I never noticed, anyway. but uh, I'll check. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know, it's crazy. Huh? Yeah. What did you enjoy? What did you... What did you feel from this job? Uh, nothing but honor. You know, a AG, I tell people, how many guys you've known have done three movies with Rocky? I have. Uh, like I say, you know, Balboa, Creed One, Creed Two. How many guys you know have done three movies with Michael B. Jordan? I have. So I've been real blessed in that, but I did Ocean's Eleven when Vladimir Klitschko fought Lennox Lewis. After that, I worked with Vladimir Klitschko, uh, the heavyweight champ of the world for eight years. I <clears throat> first one I did was with Kevin James and uh, Antonio Banderas, uh, played to the bone, and and uh, not Kevin James, uh, uh, Woody Harrelson. Then I did one with Kevin James and Salma Hayek, an MMA movie called Here Comes the Boom, and then of course Balboa and Creed One, Creed Two, and Creed Three. But yeah, I never noticed that himself. Right? It never hit me that like it hit you. Uh, but yeah, you know what an honor and. Just a little behind the scenes on on the first Creed is when I get the script, my name is Marcel. And I'm telling myself, I gotta change that. I don't know anybody named Marcel. But when it was time for Rocky to introduce us <clears throat> to the team or to Adonis, Rocky says, oh, this is Stitch, the best cut man in Philadelphia. And from there on, my name stayed and I got to play myself as himself. Uh, but the next day, I thank Sylvester Stallone. And he says, no, it has to be authentic. So, Stitch stayed. <clears throat> Pretty awesome. Who gave you this nickname, Stitch, first? Ah, good question. And <clears throat> this started when I had a school of kickboxing. I was working with world champion Dennis Alexio at that time. And his sparring partner, David Rooney, uh, fought on the undercard and I was already a trainer but I was making the adjustment into becoming a cut man and in those days it was only boxing and these guys wouldn't teach you nothing that man that told me to F you I'm taking this to my grave same thing so I, I saw through example guys used to get the, the tape for wrapping hands and little slices like this and then they would close the cut and butterfly it so I did that to David Rooney and he says, you save me stitches. I don't have to go to the hospital. I can call you Stitch. And that name has stayed with me forever. And David Rooney, last time I heard, is that he was a fisherman in Alaska. But I don't know if he knows how much he changed my life. Uh, so, yeah, David Rooney gave me the nickname Stitch. And it's funny because a lot of people don't know my real name. And... <clears throat> and this documentary that they're doing on me, they interviewed Michael, Michael B. Jordan. And in one of the little segments that he says, I'm watching it, and he says, you know, Stitch is wrapping my hands, and all of a sudden he says, Michael, do you know my real name? And he says, yeah, Stitch. I said, no, 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 no. Do you know my real name? And keep in mind, this is the third movie I've done with him. And he says, no. 
And he says, he yells, hey, anybody know Stitch's real name? Nobody did, you know, uh, but my name is Jacob. So, yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. It just seems to me many people give up on their dreams quite easily. What would you say to those who have a dream or who are about to give up their dreams? Oh man, it's, it's, when I sign autographs, one of the quotes I put is to follow your dreams because they do come true. You know, and I'm the example of your dreams coming true. You know, and I tell everybody, AG, is that line that we're all scared to cross, if we don't cross it, we'll never get to where we got to go. Uh, but I, I told all my friends and till this day as look, I'm going to the top and I'm taking the bus with me. If you want to get on the bus with me, let's go, you know, because uh, there's a lot of room to, to, to get on top. But follow your dreams. They do come true.